Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks very much for being here. Uh, my name's Eliza Canty Jones. I work at the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, welcome to folks on Facebook. We're glad you could join us as well. Um, the Oregon Historical Society is really honored to host tonight's program, and we're really eager to hear from all our panelists about the history that they share in the It Did Happen Here podcast uh, and the work of creating that. If you haven't listened to it yet, or if you've only listened to it once, uh, we definitely recommend um, putting that podcast in your feed and listening to it at least once. Um, and then of course, doing all the things like commenting and starring and all those things so that other folks find this really amazing uh, documentation and analysis of such an important part of Portland history and Oregon history, um, and even broader into US history. Our program tonight obviously is virtual, uh, but I am coming to you from my home in Southeast Portland. Uh, Portland is located on the lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. We always like to take a moment at the beginning of our programs to think about the fact that we're on indigenous land, no matter where we are in Oregon, uh, wherever we are in the United States. Uh, we're on a land that has been peopled for thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. And the indigenous people of this place continue to have deep and forever relationships with the land and the plants and the animals here. So we encourage you wherever you are to learn about the indigenous peoples whose land you live on and work on and play on. Um, and to go directly to uh, those sources to learn about those histories and cultures. Uh, the Oregon Historical Society, our mission is to preserve our state's history and make it accessible to everyone in ways that advance knowledge and inspire curiosity about all the peoples, places, and events that have shaped Oregon. Uh, and we're gonna hear a lot about some of those significant people and events tonight. So we're really grateful to have the partnership uh, with KBU and with the It Did Happen Here podcast. So the way it's gonna go tonight, we have uh, four panelists. I'll read out um, an introduction just so you can learn a little bit about each of them. And then I have a bunch of questions that we have created together before this, and I'll begin sharing those out. One of our panelists, we wanna let folks know, will not have their camera on. Uh, so occasionally you'll hear China's voice, um, but not see China's face. And we just wanna let you know that's on purpose. So be. Uh, keep your ears out for that voice when she's speaking um, as well. We encourage you to put questions in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, and if we have the opportunity, we'll pull those questions into the conversation as well. Uh, and our plan is for the program to go until uh, right up until about seven o'clock this evening. Uh, so we have some time to really get into it and, and take your questions as well. So Thanks to all of our panelists uh, for agreeing to take the time to do this program tonight. And thanks for the podcast. Uh, I'm a huge fan and I'm really excited to see more and more people get to know this work. Um, and just thinking about the fact that uh, journalists and historians in the future are gonna be referring to this podcast to, to understand so much about this place where we live. So first and foremost, thank you all very much for doing this work. So our panelists tonight include China, who is a dedicated activist, community organizer, doula, and educator. She has extensive background in community organizing as the founder and executive director of Muslims United, a nonprofit that makes space for Muslim women's leadership, as well as the Hedaya Women's Resource and Advocacy Project, an advocacy program for Muslim survivors of violence. She has worked as a science instruction and curriculum developer at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, otherwise known as OMSI, and as a science teacher at the Islamic School of Portland. China attended the historically black Tuskegee University and went on to earn her BS in biology at Portland State University. As a teenager, she found herself fighting fascism on the streets of Portland. She opens the It Did Happen Here podcast with her experience of being attacked by racist skinheads at a Portland punk show for being a black punk girl. Michael Mike Crenshaw, is a Chicago-born independent hip-hop artist, respected MC, poet, educator, and activist currently residing in Portland, Oregon. He has, was a founding member of the Minneapolis Baldies and Anti-Racist Action. He has released dozens of albums and collaborated with Immortal Technique, Dead Prez, Soul, and others. Crenshaw is the lead US organizer for the African hip-hop caravan, 
and uses cultural activism as a means to develop international solidarity around human rights and justice through hip hop and education. Mike is also the Northwest Regional Director of Hip Hop Congress and facilitates the Hip Hop Cultural Exchange projects globally. He was one of the co-hosts, producers, script writers, and music curators for the It Did Happen Here podcast. Selena Flores is a photographer and podcast producer living in Portland, Oregon. Her documentary work includes a series of COVID portraits and technical operations for live radio. Flores will continue the work of collaborating with a team to create media that educates in an engaging manner while shining a light on the racist history of the United States in the hopes of one day achieving a reckoning for the injustices of the powerful against those they continue to oppress. Flores was the director of operations, one of the co-hosts, producers, and fact checkers for the It Did Happen Here podcast. Erin Yankee is a documentarian. She works in the mediums of audio, print, and video. Her work focuses on themes of the unheard story, how place can shape a life, comparative experience across identities, and the importance of the clean and sharp edit. Her many projects include over 20 years of radio production, audio zines, self-published magazines, audio books, quite a few demo tapes, and a few pieces of vinyl. Erin was one of the script writers, editors, and music curators for the It Did Happen Here podcast and served as executive director. So thanks again to our panel. And I wanna throw out our first question uh, to Mike and China, uh, the folks who participated in the history that the It Did Happen Here podcast uh, documents and analyzes. I wanna ask you both what it was like to revisit this part of your life, uh, both in being interviewed for the podcast, in doing interviews for the podcast, and then in listening to it. Uh, did it change how you thought about that time in your life at all? Uh, is there anything you want to say about how the project has impacted your health and well-being? So there's a few questions to start with. Have at it. Would you like to start, China? No, I'd like you to start. You're a little quiet. Um, hmm. China, you are very quiet. I did hear you say, I would like you to start to mic. And oh, then maybe okay. if you've got headphones or can get closer to your mic when it's your turn, that would be awesome. Um, hey, welcome everybody and thank you for being here. And uh, I was living a life as a teenager um, and a younger man um, where my commitment to anti-fascist uh, organizing and, and, and street fighting against neo-Nazis really defined my, my identity in the sense that a lot of the struggles that I was going to as going through as a child um, and finding finding names for the things that I was struggling through against and with um, happened in that window of time in which I was a teenager. Um, becoming a self-determined human being. Um, for all the different events and, and people and circumstances that, that intersected, I found myself amongst a group of friends um, in Minneapolis who were multi-ethnic, who were in the hardcore punk scene and who were skinheads. We decided you know, that, that the skinhead subculture, the style, the music, the attitude was something that spoke to who we were trying to become and it just so happened that at the same time we were finding our identity in that subcultural movement um there was a lot of mainstream media attention being given to neo-nazis that were calling themselves skinheads so immediately there was a contradiction me being a black kid um seeing that it was apparent to me that i had to do something about it i couldn't um consciously coexist in a scene and uh, in an environment where neo-Nazis were trying to assert themselves. I, you know, growing up as a black kid, reading stories about the Klan, um, understanding the racial terror and lynching that was so much a part of, of, of the history of this country and understanding that people like me were the target of that terror. There was no way I was gonna, accept that. And the fact that I had a group of friends who felt similarly really became the, the, the defining um, 
aspect of, of, of who we were and who I became. So that said, when I, when I hear the podcast, um, the process of going out and interviewing people that I grew up with, that I fought in the streets and, and sacrificed with and shed blood with and grew to love, um, it, to me, it's one of the most affirming things that I've ever experienced in life. Uh, not only was, was, was the initial period of commitment and involvement affirming, um, but after all these decades to have time to come back as a middle-aged person, um, to reach back out to a lot of these people and to find this, this kind of collective shared uh, impetus to really expose why we did what we did is, is huge because it, it lets me know that I, I'm not alone. I wasn't alone then. And I'm not alone now, you know. And so to have the team, um, Selena and Aaron and Icky and Mo Balstern, who were, you know, helping us create the narrative aspects, we've really been able to do something as a team that none of us could have done alone. And so in 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 our own way, I feel like we've been very successful in paying homage um, to the previous efforts and bringing, bringing the previous efforts of those of us who were fighting in the streets and organizing um, into, into a light that currently is, is relevant. You know, I, I just feel like it's a gift. And, and so I'm just, I'm really proud of it. And I'm happy that, it, that it's happened. Um, you know, somebody like China. So, you know, I remember when I first came to Portland I was immediately struck by China because she was one of the only other black people in the hardcore punk scene. And even though China wasn't a skinhead, China was very um, powerful in her stance. And so I, I immediately was like, that's my person. She's, a, she's us, she's me. And so after all these years for us to be able to come together in the context of it did happen here and let our voices be heard. I just, I feel like it's a gift. China, you want to speak on it at all? Can we hear you? China, I can see that your mic is unmuted, but we're not able to hear you if you're speaking. But we want to. Yeah. <laughs> if, um, did, Eliza, do you feel like I answered that? Yeah, okay. I do feel like you answered that. And um, I'll just suggest, yeah, I'm just gonna suggest, China, if you and um, the folks on our back end, Isa and Sarah, who are our OHS support staff, if you all wanna try and work in the chat to try and see if there's something you can do to make sure we can hear your voice. And then I see Selena, it sounds like you, it looks like you had your hand up and wanna speak to this too. That'd be great. I was just going, um, China had accidentally messaged me and was saying that she was working on it. So I just wanted to relay that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, while she's working on that, I actually wanted to toss that, that question, Aaron and Selena, to you all as well. If you wanted to speak a little bit about, um, just like from an emotional standpoint, what it was like to work on this, um, you know, we can talk about the, the technical things or, you know, why and how you decided to do it, but sort of were there ways in which working on this podcast and learning in this history um, changed you? How did it make you feel and what was it like? What was it like at the end that was different from the beginning, you know? Um, for me, it was interesting because I was, mentioning this to Mike earlier, actually, that 
going into this project, I didn't have kind of a full scope of what the story would be. Um, and I started researching the people who were in the CHD and contacting them and had a list of interview questions and did a bunch of interviews. So I was only getting these kind of snapshots of the whole project. And it wasn't until we were recording the narrate narration that I actually was able to see the full scope of the project. And it dawned on me how much it covered and not to toot our horns, but that we did a really great job. Um, I guess that is tooting our horns, but um, it kind of was like this synthesis of everyone's work that came together and it was just really fulfilling to work on. It was a project that um, is, has become very close to my heart. Um, I'm definitely passionate about racial justice and also it was very educational to learn about the history of Portland. So yeah, it's been just the word fulfilling comes to mind for me. Erin? Um, yeah, I think um, I was, um, I was a punk rocker in a different scene when I heard about the murder of Mulugeta Seurat and it really, um, you know, had, that scene didn't have a, it was a pretty small town, so it didn't have a skinhead problem. Um, the way that scenes, like the place where I had moved from had a bad skinhead problem that I lived in the year before and being um, close to the Bay Area and the punk scenes they'd had very much a skinhead problem during this whole era. And so just hearing about it was just like this, you know, gut punch, like we need to do something, we have to do something. And it's just been a thing that's kind of been part of my consciousness of like, I'm moving to Portland, I'm moving to a place where this happened, I'm moving to a place where the scene um, has dealt with and is dealing with this at the time that I moved here as a, you know, at the end of it. And when I came here, the skinhead violence on the street wasn't as visible as it was during this era. Um, but it was just something that I feel like it was one of those important stories that everyone that lives here should know. And meeting Mike and knowing his connection to the Baldies and becoming friends over all the years and then having this opportunity arise through different circumstances um, and getting to make it and having this dream team to do it and all the parts were there. Um, getting it done, it just feels like a relief, like that we really did it right. I feel also very proud that we did this and proud that we did it right. And just wanted to also um, spotlight Mo Baustern and Icky A. They were part of our production team. Julie Perini also did a lot of the visual finding, but Mo and Icky really spent a lot of time with the narration. Icky lived here at the time. Mo lived in Chicago, was punk adjacent. So it was a great mix of people who were present and could really describe it from their own experiences and people who were like, I was going through the same thing in a different town. So I had that kind of perspective. Selena didn't know about it from that being around in that time period. So it could really see the things that we were too close to see. Um, so it was just a lot of different skill sets coming together and making, being able to make this possible. Hi, you guys, can you hear me? By any yes. chance? Yeah, okay. we can hear you great. Thanks, China. Okay. Um, sorry, to, it, my apologies. I, my computer, so I've joined via my phone. And um, so my apologies to you guys for just popping in late. And Mike, thanks for going first. It's just, um, I haven't really been on a Zoom call with this many people, so I appreciate that. And, um, you know, everything you said, Mike, I just totally resonate. It resonates with me um, for sure. 
And um, I mean, our experience is different, but at the same time, there's a lot of um, similarities. So, I mean, I grew up here in Portland, Oregon, um, born and raised here, born at Emanuel Hospital. And, uh, you know, when, when I was contacted to do the, to, to come and talk at KBU, I was kind of like, wow, like, wow, somebody knows about this, this, you know, it was, I mean, I, I, I almost hate to admit it, but it was, it was validating, like, wow, this meant something, because it meant a lot to me, and I knew what it meant, but that somebody, there was a, um, you know, a lot of people that were also involved, and that um, what we did affected um, was, was, I guess it was like touching, like, you kind of just kind of that part of my life I'd kind of pushed away because it was, it was tough. And it was, you know, I mean, it was, I was there, like I said, out of necessity. And I mean, I was naturally drawn to the punk rock skinhead scene because of the music that I liked. I came from a working class background and, you know, just identified with the movement. And my mom had, you know, someone that had a lot of, um, you know, she was, she had at one point been a part of the, the communist worker party. So she kind of, I wasn't raised as a communist, but she definitely raised me with uh, the value system, um, some of the value system there. So I was, you know, immediate, I had a sense of what was right and wrong. And a lot of the, the punk rockers and stuff they were into just kind of partying and doing whatever. And I saw the skinheads were a little bit more organized and kind of more focused and that definitely resonated with me but and I think at the point you know like I was a punk rocker not a skinhead is like it came down to do I want to shave my head I actually did have a fringe at one time but I was I always identified with being punk rock and not a skinhead because of, it came down to some ideological points I don't know as a teenager I, I, don't, I think I've thought of anarchy and chaos instead of you know order and militancy which is kind of what I think of as like the skinhead movement but anyway that was a long time ago so I think that, um, and doing this podcast brought up a lot of things for me. And I'd been kind of working on a book. I am, am working on a book, but it's 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 hard to write about these things. I saw some other people had written, people that were just kind of historians had written. And I was immediately like, wait, you guys weren't even there. Like, what are you saying? I mean, th these are some other book, book that came out about, you know, Mulligata Sarah. And that was such a, you know, it was such a, a, a massive turning point in my life really when we've been fighting these Nazis and kind of, you know, we didn't even know if it was real, but then when Mula Gata Sarah was killed, we knew that it was real. Um, so this pot, I'm, I'm very happy that you guys did the podcast. It was a lot of work and it's interesting to see how it's um, turned out. And it definitely is, is bittersweet for me to hear it and to remember it. And, you know, I'm glad that it's, it's, people are being made aware of it. And when I saw it, like, you know, with Antifa movement, I've definitely was like cheering all along, but like, yeah, that's like what we started. We started that. I mean, it probably before us, but I really felt like we had a hand in starting some of that. So, I mean, I just, I'm just glad to, to see it unfold and continuing to watch it unfold. Mike, is there anything in that 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 you want to comment on that before we move on to another question, you should feel free to jump in. No, I think, you know, just really reinforcing there's there's so much, you know, that comes up. But if I could if I could whittle it down to some of the more um, profound points, it is that we were able to do something that was relevant to us mm -hmm. at that time and it's still relevant. And this podcast, the process of creating it did happen here has given us an opportunity to once again be in community. Mm. Um, you know, we get in, in, in capitalism as individuals, we get so compartmentalized in our commitment and responsibility and obligations to do everything to, you know, provide access to the basic necessities. And a lot of times the, the collective activity that we engaged in in our youth is something that we don't, it almost seems impractical to continue to work collectively, you know? And so I'm just uh, recognizing and reflecting on the fact that it, it does take a collective, 
you know, to, to do impactful work. I think that's one of the things listening to the podcast, you know, um, listeners hear about so many of the different individuals, but also organizations. And so that word collective is really um, hitting with me right now, thinking about the, you know, there were parts of the podcast talking about how different groups work together, even if they didn't agree on tactics or, or work to support each other's priorities, you know, at different times. Um, and so I'm interested in hearing, you know, any more that, that you want to say about that. And also to hear about some of the ways that, that oppression showed up in the scene, um, you know, whether that's um, misogyny or, or other types of oppression as well. And China, you had brought that up um, in one of our planning calls. So I don't know if you want to take that on first, um, but thinking about those, those, you know, any of the sort of conflict within the scene and also that, um, that collective action within the scene. Sure, I can speak to that. So I think when at the time, I just saw it as a group of young people kind of all united against a common evil, so to speak. And, you know, I, I didn't, I did realize that there was like when um, some organizers came in to kind of back us, I guess is how I would describe it, that this was a, this, you know, um, this is hierarchical. And I guess we were the, the people on the street, the people putting our bodies on the line you know, um, so like, I remember the first anti-racist action meeting, and I remember I was really excited that, you know, this was part of a larger framework, and I, I mean, I was, I was a kid, you know, and um, probably, I mean, I understand, you know, you, sometimes you understand things as a kid, but you don't kind of see the big picture till you're an adult, you know, so I think I was there, but I was excited that, um, to be a part of that meeting and like, hey, this is actually going somewhere. We're not just here like, you know, street fighting because the police really tried to, you know, just portray us as a gang. And, you know, like I remember once the police stopped me and they didn't know if I was a crip. It sounds so dumb. They didn't know if I was a crip or blood or skinhead. I mean, none of those, you know, but that's kind of where they categorized what we were doing. And we were really fighting something that we knew was was deeply wrong you know just on a on a deep level and um as far as oppression i mean i just think back to that time i was talking to some other friends that um were around at that time and we were just talking about kind of the scene the you know the whole kind of i, I guess i use the word misogyny because it was really there were people that were working for justice. We were all kind of united, but then there was all this kind of abuses going on towards guys and their girlfriends and different kind of like, you know, which is, you know, it's indicative of the larger movement. There's always, you know, the fight for justice and then the, like the kind of the internal fight for doing justice. So I think there were, you know, there was definitely like, I remember people talk about going gay bashing just in the punk scene. And I remember, you know, just how violent and sickening and people talking about how they would, you know, team up on, you know, girls and women. And that, that was a reality of the space that we we're in. And I think we were building kind of the consciousness that these things are wrong. Cause I remember, um, you know, helping, friends that had been assaulted and you know just dealing with this kind of like you know you think teenagers are just dealing with like high school broken hearts we we're dealing with people that have been assaulted and that were you know afraid even within the anti-racist scene the anti because prior to you know the anti-racism but there was the punk rock scene was was pretty pretty racist and whenever you have racism you have misogyny so that kind of goes together and then i think but slowly the you know, and I think it should be noted that it was a group of kids, you know, it wasn't, they were older people, but it was a kid's movement. So as far as the stuff that we're doing, you know, you make mistakes as a kid. I think that is important, but I think we were building a consciousness. I would love to just, you know, add on a little bit and say that we always have to, you know, I'm a radical, right? So what I, when I identify as a radical, I was taught by by elder radicals and revolutionaries that what that means is that you're always gonna look for the root cause. And that the root of being radical is, is to eradicate so that when we wanna remove a weed from the garden, we don't just you know pick off the leaves or the stems, we actually have to go under and, and uproot it from the bottom. And so with the radical perspective is going to be one that allows me to 
understand the broader context. You know, we, we exist in white supremacist, heteronormative, capitalist patriarchy. It's, it's a product of our history and is not separate from it. And so the dominant culture is one that has defined so much of what we think of ourselves and how we see each other. What I will say was that even though a lot of the oppression that is, is an aspect of the broader dominant culture um, is first of all, inescapable. Um, in mainstream society, it exists, okay? In subcultural radical expressions, um, those same things are there. We're still struggling with the same issues that broader society uh, struggles with. So we're seeing people act out um, homophobia. We're seeing people act out racism. We're seeing people act out misogyny in the punk scene too. But one of the things that the punk scene did provide was a space for those of us who were radical or becoming more radical to assert the questions of like, how do we become better? And how do we root this out of our own behavior? How do we confront and be accountable for what it's actually gonna to take to make a better society or a better community? And if we have to fight, we're gonna fucking fight, you know? And so like, that's something that it's, it's messy, but that was part of what we were doing. And that, that's something that wasn't present in the mainstream society. Absolutely, Mike, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. And, you know, I observed the same thing. Yep. There's a, a review of the podcast that Holland Dagendorf, Hagendorf, excuse me, wrote for the Life Harvester. Um, and I'm going to read a, a quote from it and then just see if you all want to want to comment on it further. Um, he wrote, uh, for the collective behind it did happen here, there is no question that fascism can only be met with force. What's different about the perspective offered is that many of the subjects, teens when they were fighting neo-Nazis in the streets, are in or approaching middle age. And they have had time to reflect on the personal toll that participating in that violence has taken on them and their friends. Uh, so, so that's the, the quote from the review. And I wanted to ask Mike and China if there's, if you wanna comment on that or if there's anything else that you wanna say about violence in this history and, and your relationship with that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll speak on it. I mean, I think I've heard um, writers put to words what I felt that didn't, but didn't have the words that being black in America meant violence. I mean, our bodies, in a sense, are you know a site for violence and violence. I mean, there's really no way to escape violence if you are one way or another, if you are a black person in America, I mean, I don't want to make that true. And being a mother, I, I, I hate to see that. And, you know, that's what we have worked. I felt like, man, I was out there fighting and, you know, really working towards something. And it's to this day, we're still seeing, you know, violence enacted upon people, marginalized people. And it's, you know, violence is, you know, I hate when people talk about nonviolence and all this kind of rhetoric, but but ignore the massive violence that, you know, our whole country um, is built on and stays in power because of. Okay, that's big to say, but you know what I'm saying. So, I mean, just on a on a personal level, it's it's something that, you know, really working to to kind of sort out what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, and having to reconcile the violence and manage it and you know you know when you think about raising kids you don't want to raise kids in a in a violent space in a violent mindset so i think it there's been a lot of personal work i've had to do to you know cuz you we're like soldiers out there i mean you know mike no you know when you're out there you're like a soldier and you know it's it's a shift to be a mother and a community member and to take those steps um to find inner peace and also hold that, you know, not hold yourself like, I mean, 
there's different levels, but I, I came to the point where I was like, I did what I needed to do. And I'm not sorry for what I did. Violence, there was, I would have died if I didn't fight back. That's, that's so real, you know, being middle-aged and having a family, um, there's a lot more to lose. Being a young person with a big heart, um, I was ready to do whatever it took, but I didn't value my life as much as I do now. And that the question of the value of life really becomes, it's, it's a hard thing to kind of weigh because we ask when, when, how much of this construct of what it means to be responsible um, and successful and that, to have a nuclear family and how much of that is real and how much of it is somebody else's um, ideal that's imposed upon us. How often do we get to really like critically deconstruct these things in meaningful ways? The process of, of, of looking at what we've accepted as as reality um, and the standard is a violent process intellectually because in order to to question what we've accepted as normal, we have to really reconcile in our own consciousness the fact that this nation was built on genocide that continues. You know, we talk about First Nations, Indigenous, and Native American people often as if they're a historical relic. But when I look at some of my friends who are in the streets daily right now fighting, I have a friend who, you know, has been in the streets so much amidst the tear gas that they they feel that they miscarried because of the impact of, of the, the different gases and stuff that the police and the feds were using on the populace. So this is an ongoing struggle. And in order for the status quo to exist, there's unthinkable, unimaginable violence that is always being waged against masses of, of human beings. So when I look at my kid, I don't want them to have to fight. I don't want them to have to get hurt. Um, but I'm always asking these questions of like, what can I share based on my experience that I can pass along to my child in a way that doesn't sugarcoat things, that doesn't censor things, in a way that arms them for what this world is actually based on. But yeah, I, I, I don't want the police knocking on my door. Um, I don't want people hunting me down. And that's part of what was happening back then. You know, I would hate to be in a parking lot at a store with my family and have a car full of neo-Nazis, you know, pull up and jump out with weapons. But that was part of what used to happen. So I just, you know, it's, it's a question. What I will say is that as an adult, um, a middle-aged adult with a family, I don't want to throw my life away. I don't want to do, I don't want to kill. I don't want to take another person's life. Um, I don't want to wind up having to do decades in prison for defending my right to exist and defending my politics. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that I have the life experience that lets me know that if and when those circumstances arise that I know what to do. Thanks a lot to you both. I really appreciate that um, so much about what you said, but I think really that call to be thoughtful about um, the ways that the structures surround us are, are so deeply violent so much of the time and, and have been, you know, in our state and our nation for such a long time is just such an important, um, such an important reminder for thinking about the context of, of the history that you that you tell and, and the work that you all did um, that's told in the podcast. So I really appreciate that. And I just would, you know, invite, um, you know, if there's more that folks want to say about that to, to please do. Um, 
And I know that, you know, there's two episodes of the podcast that are that are dedicated to the stories of of individual people who were, you know, Mulugeta Sarab, one of them who did die um, as part of this. And then John Baer, who was um, involved in another death as part of this. And the I'm interested, you know, from all of you talking about to hear you talk about those those deaths and those incidents, and then also, um, you know, Aaron and Selena and, and whoever was involved in the decision to dedicate those two episodes to those individual people's lives, um, and to talk some about the decision and how you went about that as well. So, um, who, whoever wants to take it, I'll, I'll toss it open. Um, I can speak to that at least starting um, the. Mulligata Sarah was definitely the um, his killing was the flashpoint of getting people who weren't doing this fight to pay attention to what was actually happening in more of a way like oh you know it's not just a punk scene problem or okay you know it's this is a this is this is real this is like the highest circumstances but the decision to to focus on Mulugeta as much as we could of him as a human and as a person, um, so many so many I think storytelling or reporting or journalist takes on hate crimes or violence focuses on the people who do the violence. And one of the main values I think that we had as producers being part of it is that this is not about the white supremacists. You can hear the mainstream story. You can hear the police version of story. You can hear these other versions of the story somewhere else, but you have not heard the story of the people experiencing the violence and fighting back against the violence. So to um, the, um, there was a 30th anniversary um, memorial for Mulugeta's death and there was a conference around it. I can't remember who the sponsors were now, I'm sorry. Um, and then that's when the street signs went up in the Kearns neighborhood on top. There is one of the um, images of, I think the last episode of the podcast has the his um, birth and death days and photos of him um, in there all over that particular neighborhood. So um, we wanted to just more focus on the life that he did have and the impact that he did have as a human. Um, and as for John Baer, I think if you do know the story, the shortcut version is there's a bunch of boneheads around. They killed Mulligata Sarah. Everybody got pissed. We kicked their asses. John Baer killed somebody and then it was over. So if you're going to just have the sweeping five minute story, then that's what it is. So it also seemed important to um, try to tell the quote end unquote in a more nuanced way. And then John just was so um, vulnerable and open and powerful about his experiences that it just was like, we just, this is the beauty of the podcast is that it's not, it doesn't have to fit into column space or you know a, a particular broadcast time it has to be 58 minutes you know podcasts can be however long they need to be and so that's just after he told that story is like that's just what needs to happen you know the the content just spoke for the necessity of that space for that story to be told I want to uh, just contribute that, you know, the, the opportunity to reconnect with people who I knew back then, um, who I, some, many of whom I remain close with, John Bear is one of those people. But there's an overwhelming sensation of, um, it's, I, I, I don't think joy is the appropriate word, but I think there's a lot of gratitude that people we've interviewed have been expressing because a lot of these people have been sitting with these these stories you know for decades and a lot of these people are pretty humble 
And so for them to be able to tell their stories and have it be relevant and, and impactful has been really like empowering for a lot of people. Ask some more about that work of, of building trust. Um, oh, Selena, were you about to speak on that? Please go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Aaron had said about um, having the space and also focusing on the humanity because it's so easy to hear a name and kind of um, kind of in one ear and out the other this day and age. And so to focus on that, these are real people with real lives. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things we talked about in preparation was the the work of of building trust with people. You know, Mike, you were saying that a lot of these folks um, have been really humble um, and and have been appreciative of the opportunity to tell their stories and contribute to this. And I think also there's, um, you know, th th there there is some danger also, um, as you're you know have been talking about as well. And so if you would, all would want to talk some about the process of what it was like to to reach out to people, how you connected with networks um, to bring folks into the process of being interviewed and, and participate in this and sort of how you want to how you went about that to to gather the group. That would be great. I don't want to talk too much, so. <laughs> it's easy to talk a lot. I did want to produce uh, a podcast about the, the experience of being a black skinhead specifically. And I was having trouble getting it off the ground. Um, just because, you know, a lot of commitments, very little time. And around that time, Aaron, uh, approached me and said, hey, you know, there's potentially some resources that KBU has to do a podcast about the anti-racist activism that intersects with the stories of, of what you're trying to work on. And without that conversation, I would have never been um, compelled to go, okay, I'm going to commit you know, and stop procrastinating and stop putting things on the back burner, you know, and I was able to go now knowing that there was uh, material support for the project and for the effort, I was able to go reach out to people with a, a greater sense of uh, determination and certainty about what was going to happen. But during that process, the the outcome of, of what manifested as the it did happen here podcast far exceeded what I imagined. Excuse me. Um, and as Mike went out into the world to collect stories from his people, his community, um, I started working on it in town. And a lot of the building's trust was like, you know, Mike and I had built trust over just being friends for years. And so when I could call up these people or just say like, I'm working with Mike Crenshaw, they're like, great. I have no idea who you are. It doesn't, you, you're with Mike, it's great. So, um, so Mike just did a lot of the trust building in that initial, um, just his life experience by being an amazing human and like community member. Um, and there was another with John Bear, it was um, another friend of our friend Doug, who I've known for 30 years. And he's like, oh, you're friends with Doug and you're working on this with Mike. Yes, I'll come in. And then once he had the experience with me, then he's like, OK, I will give you someone else's number. And then that person you know, it's like, okay, once people actually got to know me, they were more open about sharing their community because these people are very protective of each other for obvious reasons now that you, 
you've all heard the podcast. So um, it's really was relying on Mike's um, community building to get the fighters, especially to talk to us. Um, part of KBOO's resources was being able to have folks do some of the interviews with us and to be able to pay Selena for her time actually also tracking people down and doing the same thing for more of the CHD connected people. And um, you can speak to that, Selena, more than, more than I can for sure. It was kind of a domino effect in a way. So that once um, it was really being able to find Abby Layton on uh, Facebook and she really connected us to so many people in the CHD. Um, and there, Jonathan Mizaki in particular was um, very consci conscientious about um, vetting and it helped to have KBU to reference and be able to say like, there's this organization behind us and also just to be persistent um, and to kind of convey the, the gravity of what we're working on and why their knowledge and uh, experience was so important to record and share. Can you give us some examples of some of those folks that you reached out to and sort of, Selena, I think maybe you came to, you learned about this history maybe later than everybody else involved in it. So can you talk some about how you came to learn about this and, and what it was like to sort of put the pieces together in your head as you began interviewing more people and learning more and, and what resources other than people you maybe went to to learn more of this history, so. Um, well, it really did not all come together in my mind until the episodes were, um, sorry, that's my cat sneezing if you heard that, um, that it didn't all really come together in my mind until I heard the episodes. And because interviewing people and having the, this list of questions and even receiving the answers, it was kind of this disembodied, uh, non-contextual information. And hearing it in, the actual episodes with the narration and with the other, um, like the fighters interviews, uh, I was like, oh, this is so important. And this makes so much sense. Um, I th maybe that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's like some writers say that they don't really know what they want to say, that you have to do the process of the writing until you understand what what your point is you don't know yeah. before you start working on it yeah it was really cool to see it unfold yeah i'm imagining your um whiteboard behind you aaron with being a like puzzle of trying to put it all together china do you want to talk at all about what it was like to be reached out to and you know what convinced you to say yes and 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 participate um what that was like well i think um Mike had initially reached out to me um, and then, and he, he was going to talk to me. And so I was willing to talk to Mike because I knew, you know, who he was. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember, I, I remember when Mike first came to town, I think I was a teenager. So it was a long time ago, but anyway, he reached out to me and then something happened. I forget what, but then ended, Selena had reached out. So I think just knowing that Mike was a part of it, um, made me feel like this was something legit that I could, I could, um, you know, speak to. Cause I knew that, you know, I didn't know who else was involved, but I know that you guys asked me, I, I think Selena had asked me, um, Selena interviewed me of other people that were there. And I, you know, mentioned a few people, but I, you know, I used their, their street name or whatever. Cause I didn't know what, you know, people, some people don't want to be contacted. I mean, I've kind of done a lot of, um, Kind of, I had to, because I had to go underground is kind of how it felt to protect myself because of the, 
apparently there was like a hit out on us from the Tom Metzger. So I remember a group of skins coming up here and saying that they were looking for me and a couple of other people. I can't even remember. So, you know, it, it was something that I had to distance myself from. And I kind of left the community um, just because it wasn't safe for me. I had to, to move on. But so, I, you know, so I trusted it because Mike and then, you know, just I wanted it to I felt like, you know, it was good to speak about um, what had happened and because nobody had really asked before. And like, I'm, I'm here telling war story, telling these people stories. People are looking at me like, what? You know, because, you know, the life that I'm in now apparently doesn't um, seem to match what was going on. That I'm definitely the same person, but, you know, you know, you do a lot of work to build yourself. And, you know, I had to leave the scene to take care of myself. You know, I had to leave it. And that was... It's not that I didn't have love, but sometimes you just got to take care of yourself. And I haven't left the community. I still do community work, but, in, you know, there's there's many different different ways to do that. You know, like being a mom and raising kids is, is it's it's a lot. You know, it's that's an activism in, it, in its own right. Anyway, um, I just I just trusted the process. You know, I mean, it's been what, 30 something years, I, you know, since all that happens, so I felt like it was safe to speak. And, you know, I knew Mike and I, I know about, I mean, I'm, I listened to KBU when I was like an 11 year old and that was the only place you could hear underground punk rock, you know, that's, so I, I trust KBU, you know, you'd hear all these underground, now it's like available, but that was where, that was my source. So I was kind of um, happy to loop back in a way of sorts to KBU. Yeah, we didn't have the internet back then. You couldn't just click and find anything. So, um, exactly. yeah. What has it been like, Mike, in China? Just to speak more about that, to, to what have been the reactions from the podcast from either folks who were in the scene with you, who were, who were in the community with you at the time, or from other folks who you've, who've met since then who maybe learned more about that part of your life from listening to the podcast? What have, what have the reactions been like? Well, I'll, I'll just speak really quick. So a lot of people, I mean, I have a few friends from back then and we really, they were so like, wow, they were like, you know, you, we need to hear the story. It's so important. So my few handful of friends that knew, knew me then and knew about the podcast were really excited. And it's been kind of my community that I'm, my main community, they don't know this, this part about me. So this has been kind of interesting for them to see this other, um, part of me that's very much a part of me um it's just been it's been interesting and i think it's still unfolding yeah i um can you eliza can you restate that i just don't you're you're muted yeah. i don't want to go off on a tangent and like not but if it's an interesting tangent, we want it. Um, but it was what I was asking is, uh, what of the reactions from uh, folks either who were who were in community with you then, or maybe who don't know that much about this part of your life? So from both of those groups, what have the reactions to the podcast been like? You know, it's it's been good to see and hear the responses from people in my community um, who weren't part of it. Um, it's, you know, there was a lot of importance attached to the commitment and the sacrifice, you know? And for all these years to have passed, and now for people who weren't part of it to go, man, I'm really glad that these stories are being told. And to know that it inspires people is, is amazing. I mean, what more can we ask for, right? Um, for people who were part of it, I just got wind that two of my friends who were fellow Minneapolis Baldies um, and anti-racist skinheads, both non-white, a black uh, anti-racist skinhead, one of my best friends, David Jeffries, and another, uh, one of the co-founders of the Baldies, uh, Native American, Jay Nevels, they're going to do their own podcast now called Sticks and Stones. And so what I'm hoping is continued inspiration, you know, that more people are going to be encouraged to tell stories from their perspective. Because ultimately, what we want to be able to do, you know, is, and I'm speaking in kind of a generic sense, what we want to be able to do is inspire 
future generations to go, you know, these things that I'm feeling have a place. And there, there's ways to do something about the way I feel with other people. I think that's so key that that we let letting the the next generations know that they aren't alone in a way, and that you know, I, I think what you said is the, absolutely because I, I see younger people hearing about this and that are interested in activism and what the movement has been like, and for them to know that there were people that started this a long time ago is is empowering and and validating for them. I think. I'd be really interested to hear you all speak some about what you're seeing, um, what you haven't seen, particularly over the past year. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, fighting happening in the streets. There's fighting between um, anti-fascist activists and white supremacists and, and neo-Nazis for sure. Um, and then also fighting between anti-fascist activists and, and police um, really explicitly. And so as you're seeing that and you know mike you talked about you know being in touch and having close friends who are engaged in some of that work right now i'm interested to know what you're what you think about that as you're looking at it what are the connections between the the anti-racist actions that that you all undertook and that that were discussed in the podcast and and what do you want to say about um you know those kinds of fights that are happening now I would say particularly here in the Pacific Northwest, but also feel free to to broaden it out because you know we do know these fights are happening not just here, but you know in other parts of the United States and in other parts of the world, um, as we see so much fascism. So, how, what do you want us to think about on those parts? Uh, we have a role to play, all of us, each and every one of us. You know. The, the information is available. We can look critically at history and the current moment, and we can actually visualize where things are headed. It doesn't take, you don't have to be a genius or a rocket surgeon, <laughs> right? <laughs> you just have to pay attention and look at where things are and i think this thing that happened uh what the, the insurrection right the dumpster fire that happened on january 6 like these things are all predictable what well, you can you the short side it could blame donald trump but what we're seeing is a continuum you know of white supremacist violence based on this entitlement to land and resources and the use of violence to secure dominant, you know, dominance. And that's what, unfortunately, that's what this nation was built on. And it's still at the core of how people are behaving. So we're gonna continue to see um, the vanishing of white entitlement based on the objective realities of capitalism, transitioning um, from extraction um, into speculation. And what happens when, when you transition from extraction and production and manufacturing into speculation is that financial products no longer have anything to do with labor. And in that masses of workers who had, previously held a premium on their access to the highest paying jobs are now unemployable. But instead of looking at that process scientifically as part of uh, economic transition, what they're gonna be doing is scapegoating. And the lie and the mythology of white supremacy told them that they were on top because they had a God-given right to be on top. And they believed that lie for so long that it's, um, it's very hard for them to acknowledge that it was a lie. And they would rather kill than to accept. 
that it would be in their interest to let go of the lie. So that's what we're facing. We're going to see more violence. Um, the state is in an interesting position because the state is moving from an explicitly white supremacist fascist um, orientation into a neoliberal fascist orientation. And what I mean when I say neoliberal, it has more to do, the state interest now has, has more to do with um, unregulated free market speculation on a global level where the ultra rich are in it with each other to become ultra rich. And so there's so it's, it's, it can be very confusing to listen to uh, the media say things like, well, when the people stormed the Capitol on January 6th, there were all these uh, active military uh, people and, 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 and all these off duty police, how could that possibly happen? How could that not happen? So when we, you know, when we're fighting Nazis as teenagers, what we're actually fighting against is we're fighting against the working class foot soldiers who drank the Kool-Aid of white supremacy, who were the buffer between true um, revolutionary movement for human rights and justice in an egalitarian sense. They were the buffer, the white working class has always been the buffer between the progress that we could make as a society and the rule of the elite. And they're still here. So we, what we have to look forward to is a reckoning that can involve a shift in consciousness and that's the work we have to do. How do we do the work in society that can inform and, and transform our collective consciousness so that we no longer um, allow our self-interest to be aligned with destruction. Wow, what else can I add to that, Mike? I mean, amazing vision, and I see everything that you're saying. Um, all I could speak to is, I mean, what I what I see is that the mask is off. I mean, if it was ever on, and I asked myself, is are things more violent than um, are the police more violent than they were back then? But no, they weren't. It's just that maybe there's more mass violence where we're hearing about it more. So I think we're seeing um, exactly what Mike is saying. I think we're seeing kind of the breakdown of of our society, and the, and and there is a I don't want to say a war, but there's definitely a a movement of and shift from wealth and power um, and a redistribution to the to the people, you know, is is what I you know is what I see too. I think, you know, we're seeing we're seeing very blatant acts of racist bullying. And I and I often question my is this was it this bad before? I mean it must it was terrible before, but it seems like um people that we see as professionals like teachers or you know, you know, just people that are supposed to support just showing these blatant racist, you know, ugly racist faces. I mean, they were always there obviously, but it's like, we see the demon, I see it, you know, um, sadly very often. And, you know, it's it's not new, but you just sometimes the, the violence and the abuses and what people are facing, I mean, the you know, you know, forces that are supposed to protect us, killing people that are protecting people you know what i'm saying and it's some people you know it's like who's who can you trust you know and certainly we know better about who we can trust but you still find yourself saying who can we trust who can we trust yeah and to add to that with the the masks are off and more people are seeing the white entitlement and the white supremacy that we have been you know that's been part of this you know, this culture since it's been invented. Um, one of the things I feel like that people comment on often is like, these people were kids. A lot of the interviews say it, like we were kids, we were just kids. And the people currently who are doing this fighting on the street 
as Antifa, as whatever, are also just kids. And we, as the rest of society, have a responsibility to support those kids because the police are, you know, the police are involved in white supremacy and upholding power. Um, the structures of society that white people are taught to use to protect themselves are all white supremacists. So these kids who are doing the work now have much less visible support from the overall community that I think has happened definitely after the Mulligata Sarah murder, definitely not was happening before that, you know. So I think those of us who maybe aren't street fighters or who have families or who have more to lose or who have more injuries or something, there's a role that we need to play to not involve the state, to not involve um, white, supreme white supremacist structures and to support these people who are actually fighting white supremacy. And so we just have to, you know, figure out your way to do it and figure out what you're comfortable with, figure out what's needed, um, listen to the Antifa and Street Fighter kids when they tell you and believe them when they tell you things and step up. And I it, think it's, it, it, oh, sorry, Mike. I was just gonna say, interrupt, you know, interrupt that. What, what Aaron said, step up, I wanna add on. Inter, when you see it going down, interrupt. And I also wanna say that, you know, we hear about a diversity of tactics, a diversity of tactics are needed. And to think about, I guess I think about people on the streets as like, holding a line, they've drawn a line and they are holding that for all of us. And um, they do need support for sure. And I think we need to, to spread the work out. I mean, absolutely, we support the, the kids and the people that are out there fighting, but we can't just, you know, lean on them so much that they're, you know, getting hurt and burn out people more people with privilege need to step up and fight this fight. It's not just these kids out there, people that are so marginalized, they really feel that they have no choice but to fight, but people that are in privilege who need to address your privilege every day and support, you know, financially. If you can't go fight, you know, show up, support some of the, the, um, the groups with your, with your money, with your car, your transport, your, your, um, your access to legal systems, your access to educational systems. I mean, we have to start leveraging our privilege if we have it. And we all have varying degrees of privilege. I mean, as Americans, we have a privilege, um, but you know, everyone has different degrees. So I'm really about anal everyone analyzing their own privileges and leveraging it as best as they can. Not to the point where we don't have enough for ourselves, but where we are just constantly in a space where we're adjusting and thinking how we can support and not just relying on the work of people that are putting their bodies on the line. Thanks y'all. Well, we're, we're um, nearing the time we had set aside for this conversation. So I'll just do one more um, shout out if folks have questions to go ahead and put them in the chat or in the comment on Facebook and we'll get them moved over here. So if there are any audience questions to so go ahead and, and put those in. Um, and I guess, you know, one other question that I want to make sure we don't miss, and, and maybe you've touched on some of this already, but feel free to just reiterate or emphasize a point would be, what is it that you really want to make sure that people take away from this history um, and take away from the, the stories of the, the people and, and the events and the ideas that are, that are told in the It Did Happen Here podcast? Uh, what do you want to make sure that we know when we listen to that and come away with it? There's uh, a time to fight uh, with your body. And we can't afford to be careless about the ways we fight with our bodies. Um, we have to be smart, we have to be strategic, we have to be informed, and we better not be alone. It's not a fair fight, you guys. So 
we fight together because it's not fair. We fight together because we fight to survive. Unfortunately, we're often, when, since we're facing a dominant system, we're often on the defense um, and we're fighting to survive. One day we'll fight to win, but for now, survival is, is synonymous with, with the win. Um, when we're not fighting with our bodies, ideally we, th that only happens sometimes only when necessary. Um, we have to fight with all the other resources we have. Like China said, our access to different degrees of privilege becomes a tool and a weapon with which to wage this fight. And one thing I'm very clear about, I'm all about egalitarianism and, and acceptance and, and accountability and inclusivity and this, that, and the other, but white supremacy is evil. Racial terror is evil. The, the, the very existence of the ideological framework is based on people getting away with murder. Truly evil, absolutely. So let's not forget that. When we wanna make a, make a fair and equal level playing field for everyone to have their objective you know, opportunity to say what, what they say, we cannot tolerate uh, racial terror and violence. It, it does not have a place in the type of world we, we want to create. One thing I would like people to take away is to keep in mind that histories can be forgotten and erased and that it's important to keep those stories alive and remember and pass it down, um, document. And I think um, also like this is a, in total, it's a six and a half hour podcast. And this is years and years of people's lives and multiple people's lives and perspectives. So it's reductive and I, you know, luckily we did, we have, a, a, we have, you know, we did our best and there's a lot of people who see themselves in these experiences, but there's a lot of experiences of people who, you know, didn't live through it and, or who can't, who don't feel safe talking about it or who had to um, leave in the middle of the fight because of, you know, the, you know, couldn't, couldn't hang anymore with the interpersonal violence or problems or whatever, you know, there's a lot of reasons. So um, also just remember, I think every historical perspective that gets told like this is reductive and it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind um, when you're listening to any, any stories, including this. And it is important to keep telling your stories to make sure that like they do eventually get included in you know an official event like this like you know i'm really appreciative to the oregon historical society also knowing that this isn't the kind of work that they do very often because it is a real people's grassroots from the from a perspective that's often left out so I appreciate the room being made on this platform for this to happen. I just wanna say, I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate everyone, but I know Mike and then Selena. So I appreciate you, you know, leading, making the space to tell the story. Cause I agree, we have to tell the stories. History is forgotten often and we have to, we should tell our story um, so that, for one, so that someone else can't rewrite it in a negative way, and also because it, it is easily to be forgotten. And I want to reiterate what Mike said: there, there, this, this white supremacist um, system is evil, and there isn't a two sides kind of equal um, equal participation. That's a lie, you know. So yeah, there is there is a side of justice, and uh, thanks for um, creating this platform. Uh, thank you all.
We have an audience question that I think touches on some of what you were just talking about. You know, there, there, there are all, you know, we, we talk about this a lot at, at, at the historical society, like we could never get all the perspectives of all the people who, who lived, you know? Um, and I, you know, we've also talked about when we've done work on white supremacy, just making very clear, like, this isn't a subject we're neutral on. This isn't something that we're interested in, in offering like both sides, like it's deadly, it's, it's bad, you know? Um, and there's a, a question from an audience member about what's the, the best way to guard against propaganda or rumors or lies that, that undermine solidarity. Um, because there are, you know, there are opposing narratives out there to, you know, the ones that you've told in this podcast. Any tips on that for our audience member or ways to think about um, how to maintain solidarity in the face of, of propaganda and rumors and lies? I'll speak to, oh, go ahead, Mike, you're gonna speak. Oh, uh, go ahead, Tana, I'll, I'll speak after you. Okay, I was just gonna say, um, go to the source, you know, don't be that person to hear something and spread it, go talk to, to if you can, and research, you know, um, cause gossip is just, you know, gossip and rumors are just, it's, it's, it's just kind of a low way of, of thinking and, you know, even in social circles, if you hear something about someone, you don't just believe it, you check it out. So, you know, stick to to facts and things that, you know, talk to the people anytime that you can find out what's the real story. You know, there's always going to be propaganda, rumors, lies, this kind of bizarre alter story that, you know, like, again, this kind of trying to create something of there being two sides um, and there's, there really isn't here. So I think just, you know, question, question everything actually, and do your research. Being a cis born able-bodied male, I have um, been encouraged to use the space that I take up in a way where it's easier for me to feel confident and assertive about facing problems um, that some other people, facing some problems head on that some other people might not feel safe doing. So I wanna acknowledge that. But I also wanna say, go, like China said, go to the source, communicate directly. If, if you have heard something about somebody that you, you value who they are, but it's troubling what you heard, it's more important, even if it takes time for you to build up your, your confidence and your plan, it's more important for you to talk to that person directly and give them the opportunity to convey understanding um, than to destroy relationships with people who are potential allies. And we have to be careful uh, language and semantics. We hear about cancel culture. Well, there's a reaction to cancel culture coming from the right that seeks to discredit it. And that that's not uh, healthy because what they're trying to do is protect and maintain their power. But I want us on the left to be critical of how cancel culture can be a tool that operates against our best interests. And that when we hear things about people and all of a sudden those people want to you know, there's a movement to deplatform people based on hearsay. That's that's dangerous. Um, talk to people directly in confidence and develop your own awareness and understanding of exactly what's going on before you make a decision to um, move against people. And I also wanted to add to that that. Um, you know, part of one of the things that people brought up about us, everyone doing this work at the time being teenagers is there was a lot of time to hang out. This is like activism based on friendship and trust and knowing each other. So um, there's, you, we just have to put in the time to make the community so that we do actually know each other. And then that will make it easier to then directly talk to people when there are issues and problems. It's like, first we have to, there is no shortcut into le learning each other and making real community. 
No, Erin, just to follow up on that, there's a, a question from an audience member about knowing that you've done a lot of anti-racist work, you know, as a white person. And, and I think they're asking for, um, you know, what it means to be a, a white activist in anti-racist work. And do you, I feel like you answered that question in some ways, just in what you were just talking about. Do you want to speak on that a little bit more? Um, I could speak on it a little. I mean, I think it's mostly like white supremacy is white people's problem. And, you know, like, how are you going to live with yourself if you're not doing your best to fight a system that doesn't value equal humanity? Like, it's just, it's just kind of a no brainer to be a white activist, to be an ally is, is to risk making mistakes and keep working, keep showing up, like be terribly embarrassed and shamed for um, stupid things that I have said or thought or done, but I, you know, like very well programmed as a white person in this society. So being very well programmed and also trying to fight that with every fiber of my being is a weird and complicated place to be that's sometimes real gross and sometimes is, you know, it's sometimes very sweet then to have the relationships with people who, um, because of watching me fall on my face and get up and do it again, there's a lot of like sweetness and trust there. So um, I think that's, yeah, what it means to be is to be fully willing to act like an idiot and admit it and then keep going, you know, like shame is a gross sidekick that I have as a white person and eventually, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully that future folks won't be so well programmed and their shameful sidekick will get, uh, you know, disappear eventually. You know, that's what we can help for. That's what we can work for. Fingers crossed. Thanks, I appreciate that. And then there's just one other question about uh, the skills and tactics that anti-racist action um, use that were described in the podcast. And if anybody has um, tips on who's uh, teaching folks those skills um, today, I feel like it's that's happening in a lot of places, but if anybody has a specific that they wanna recommend, we'd love to hear it. Uh, study. Look at the history. Look at the, use this use this podcast as a resource. Listen to the stories, and then figure out how to do those things in your own way with people that you trust. Um, I I think a lot of us want to follow recipes, and I get why. But some of the best food is 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 your your cooking based on the fill. You know, you know what you know how much to put in because you you know what you're going for. You're reverse engineering the outcome based on what your 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 greatest desires are. So uh, yeah, there are those of us who have done this already and there are gonna be podcasts and books and articles and things that you can read. And I wanna encourage you to do that and look deeper in the history of an anti-fascist and anti-racist movements and anti-oppression movements from other countries and other cultures and other societies. Um, but ultimately, there's gonna be a degree of you figuring out how to do what's real and right for you with the people that are real and right for you to do it with. And you gotta be willing to do that. Thank you. Any final words before we say our thanks and let you all go? Um, the group that held the Mulligata Syrah 30th anniversary event was the Urban League of Portland. Um, Mo, uh, one of our fact checkers actually texted me that. So once again, shout out to Mo. Um, and um, also next Thursday, if people are interested in more of the, what you can do, what's been happening um, next Thursday, um, the Multnomah County Library is hosting a conversation with um, Scott Nakagawa and Eric Ward, and they'll, um, I'm sure, have a lot of advice on 
uh, what to do in these uh, current times. And I think, Selena, do you remember when it starts? I'm kind of, that's. I want to say six-ish. That's what I was thinking too, yeah. Uh, six, next Thursday. And then the Thursday after that, then Selena and Mike and I will be talking about more of the podcasty parts of making the podcast. So the next two Thursdays, if you're interested in this, you can follow us along to the uh, Multnomah, Multnomah County Library Zoom link. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you, um, Oregon Historical Society. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to my, my cohort, Selena and Aaron. One love you guys. Thank you all very much. We appreciate you. Have a great night. Thanks audience for being here. We'll post this on our website so folks can come back to it. Take care everybody.